All right, welcome in to another edition of Carbs Corner. Pretty excited uh, to be able to preview the Toledo game coming up this weekend. Also, uh, some other big games around the Big Ten that will matter that the Big Ten needs their teams to kind of get pulled, pull their weight, get a win here. It'll help Buckeye Nation. It'll help set up the perception of strength in the conference. So we'll preview some of those. You know, my three big things to watch for, kind of keys, to the game uh we'll get into that and then also some uh some of the players to watch for on the toledo side um and how they're looking and what they're going to ultimately bring to the table uh first going to start off with you know a couple of things that i'm going to keep my eye on during the game uh number one going to be the the rep progression of lathan ransom and josh proctor josh proctor big time recruit projected started this year you know, they'd rotate some in the back end uh, but early in the year, play one, actually, it gives up, misses the tackle, gives up a long pass. Lathan Ransom plays a lot the rest of the game. Does a really good job. Very strong tackler. They talked about the meeting Ryan Day discussed and Jim Knowles about how he met with Perry Eliano. They had a discussion, like men talked about it. And Ryan said he'd get another chance. So he played more against Arkansas State, and Lathan Ransom played as well. But just going to kind of watch and monitor to see how each of those guys are playing. Not necessarily to see who I think should play more because I, I really like both of the guys and they're going to be able to give you something a little different um, with what they ultimately bring to the table. But just to kind of see the body language, th there's been a massive maturity that's happened uh, with Josh Proctor. and He's done a much better job. And so I think you're going to begin to see the best of him. And Latham Ransom, you know, has, has always been a very mature kid since day one, since he got here. So I want to take a look at that, kind of monitor that as the game goes along. Uh, something else we're going to take a look at is Ryan Day mentioned the fact that Jackson Smith and Jigba and Julian Fleming, two of the top wide receivers for Ohio State, would be back. You know, Now we've got a chance to see Marvin Harrison Jr. watch him go off in the second game. Uh, we got to see Emeka Ibuka go off in the first game. And so how are they going to build this rotation now with these guys back in the mix? And you know, we've seen some, you know, unlikely heroes in the first game, Xavier Johnson with the go-ahead score and all these things. Like So there's a lot of stuff ultimately there. That wide receiver room it was crowded despite there being some injuries, guys getting you know newly injured and you know, these guys getting back. But just how does this rotation work? And, you know, can JSN, can he just kind of pick up where he left off? Will he be able to be that guy that we saw in the Rose Bowl? And not that he's going to have, you know, another 350, 400-yard game receiving, but will he be just as, uh, just as effective in some limited work uh, that he's going to get, because I know they probably don't want him to play a ton of snaps, but ease him back in before the Big Ten, Big Ten slate. And then on the other side, that Julian Fleming, you've heard me talk about him in the offseason, a guy that rededicated himself to his craft in this team, uh, You know, I think saw his opportunity maybe slipping away and wants to make the most of it, had an awesome summer, had a great uh, training camp, and is really focused in and done a tremendous job, and then unfortunately just slowed down by some nagging injuries. This is going to be a big game for him and excited to kind of see him, how they work him back. And he was playing really well at the end of camp. And will he continue that momentum? Will he be able to still have that and keep that rolling as the season goes on? So this is going to be a nice start for both of those guys. And I know Jackson played in the first game, but not a whole lot and not that effectively, but to kind of launch those guys and kind of blend them in there with the rest of the receivers who've been doing really a tremendous job. The heart line has had them going in a big way, and they look really, really good. So how are they going to do this? Will they be able to have that chemistry? We saw, you know, CJ in the first game, you know, not that he looked bad, just a little hesitant. The chemistry didn't necessarily appear to be there with all the wide receivers all of the time. So now that we've got these guys back and they're close to being healthy and they're going to be able to play on Saturday, probably in more of a limited role, but will that be just something where you're able to pick up where you're left off? Like that's that's what I'm going to try to figure out. I'm going to see how fluid they look. It doesn't mean, like I said, they have to have huge days. But they're getting in and out of their breaks. They seem like they're on the same page with CJ. Those are the things that I'm ultimately going to be looking at. Uh, and then lastly, one other thing that I want to take a look at is Kyle McCord, the backup quarterback. We watched him go in against Arkansas State. Didn't really throw the ball a lot. I believe he was three for four passing, just some elementary stuff. And I know Ryan Day doesn't want to run the score up. Like, that's not the objective. But you want to ultimately see what you have in your backup quarterback as well. 
CJ Stroud, most likely his final year, he will be able to enter the draft after this season. And so with that, you got to figure out what you have in Devin Brown and Kyle McCord. Kyle McCord, very talented guy, came in, five-star recruit, went to school with Marvin uh, Harrison Jr., been here for a couple of seasons. Now you're starting to see what he is made of. So I want to see, can he go out there? Can we have a fluid understanding and control of the offense? You know, he was battling last year for potentially to get in on that starting job and looked, looked very good. He was just very new to the system. And so now that he's been in it, well, Ryan, let him go out there and maybe spread his wings a little bit as you look at the rest of the season and you're not sure how many more opportunities you'll have. Yeah, I know there will be some in the Big Ten, but generally in the non-conference, that's the chance you get to look at maybe some of your younger guys, some of your guys that aren't playing quite as much, and especially at the backup quarterback position where that's not something you're going to just roll through to get a guy reps. You're not going to take CJ out until you know he's got the game in hand, got the stats that you need, all the different things that you look at. That's when Kyle McCord will ultimately get in the game. So in this situation, hopefully that should be, you know, I would, I'm hoping in the third quarter, it'll be a night game. It'll be a good environment. Toledo has a live defense. So I think that that'll be something fun and functional to see, to experience like how much does Kyle McCord play and what ultimately does Ryan day allow him to do? And do they you know, take the reins off a little bit, allow him to push the football some and just to see what he can do um, out there, you know, in a real game situation. Uh, so want to take a look now at three like keys, three things I'm going to be watching, you know, in this game. And I wouldn't call them concerns, but three things to kind of work on. You could call it three keys to victory, but I'm hoping that this game is ultimately going to be won and, and should be decided halftime, early third quarter. Because that's that, that's what it should be with the talent discrepancy here. But number one, forcing turnovers for the defense. They've been fantastic. They gave up 12 points last week, 10 points the week before, one touchdown in two games. I hope they... Do not give up another touchdown and hold them out of the end zone. They're one of eight teams in college football yet to force a turnover. So I know that's something that Jim Knowles wants to get corrected. He's not concerned about it. He said that I'm not concerned about it. I'm more concerned about playing great defense, being in the best position, playing great red zone defense, stiffening up, not a bend but don't break defense. Because last week, a lot of those drives were aided by penalties. But making sure you're very efficient and effective in the red zone, which is a critical part. Being really good on third down is a critical part. Being good in the two-minute situation, end of half, end of court uh, game, very critical. But turnovers, you want to try to force those. And they come in bunches. And so Jim Knowles said, just continue to do what you need to do. Continue to do what you've been doing. They have athletic guys. They will begin to force turnovers. Mike Hall. Some of the young guys, the the offense, the defensive linemen will be able to get pressure on the quarterback. You get strip sacks, you get balls flying in the air. And the way the linebackers are hitting and the safeties, the ball will cough up for running back. So those things are going to happen. Those opportunities will present themselves. You don't go hunting turnovers and freelancing and trying to go make something happen. You do your job to the very best that you can. And then when you do that and you're a phenomenal athlete and you do it in an extraordinary manner, that is when some of those turnovers come when you're able to jump around because you had great uh, film when you're able to get beat a guy in a pass rush, you get a strip sack or you hit a quarterback as the ball is coming out and it flutters away. Then you get a pick in the secondary. Those things are going to happen. I'm convinced of it. Hopefully this week is when they break on through and ultimately begin to get some turnovers. Second penalties nine last game. And I've talked about this a lot. Talked about how this in the, the shows this week, about ultimately, you know, what you're doing to correct those penalties, how you're trying to fix them, whether they're pre-snap penalties, which are ones of focus, offsides, false start, procedure penalties, technique ones, which are the holdings, the face masks, both on offense and the defensive side, you know, and how those are happening. And then ultimately, um, post-snap penalties, which are just simply discipline penalties, which you need to get out of there. And we saw that happen a little bit. I know Ryan Day has cut that down. Shut that down. Cut it off. Head of the snake. That's not going to happen anymore. The post snap are highly controllable. The other two, you got to focus. And then the technique piece, you work on that. But this team didn't, didn't bite you against Notre Dame when the offense had some penalties. Didn't impact you against Arkansas State when the defense you know, had a, ton, a, a number of penalties. 
but against better teams, it's going to. So you can't let this linger throughout the season. This would be a great time to ultimately cut this thing off and make sure that the penalty issue is put to bed. And once you put it to bed, you don't want to wake it back up. Let that thing rest, let it lie, and make sure that they're done. So I'm going to be watching this five or fewer penalties in this game. I'd like to see three or fewer, but I'll be happy with five. Because you're going to get some. You're going to have you know your PI here and there. You're going to get an offensive holding here and there. Like those things are going to happen. But I don't need to see the false starts. I don't need to see guys jumping off sides. I know that they have 12 TFLs and the D line is getting off the rock and going to play in the backfield. But be disciplined. Have great eye control. Watch the ball. And then ultimately post snap stuff. That's done because that's that's nonsense. And Ryan Day is not going to allow that anymore. And the third thing I'm going to be watching here is offensive line and running game. They started getting it going against Notre Dame. At the end, you could see the offensive line starting to punch holes, get some of those seams, vertical cracks, and you can see Mayan pounding dudes. Travion was starting to pound their way through there. Arkansas State wasn't as impressive as I thought it could be or should be with who you're playing because you always have to remember, you know, taking into account your opponent. If you execute the way you should, it doesn't matter. And don't drop to the level of your opponent. You should be able to push them off the ball and ultimately make waves. So I'm going to watch in the offensive line in the running game because they came out and said, you know, we want to be able to run it when we want to. Not, you know, because you have to. On third and down, it should be a choice. Third and one, it should be a choice to go run the football. Third and two, a choice to run the football. You shouldn't have to, you know, shouldn't have to pass it there. You should be able to run it because you want to run the football. So that's a big element of it. And just trying to work through that whole process. They need to get it going. And I know Justin Fry has been working with them and they're getting it going, getting that mentality, getting the low pad, firing off the ball, controlling the line of scrimmage. Because this offense, as good as it is passing and throwing the football, you need to make sure that it's really good in the running game as well, because that's how you salt away games. And especially against better teams, you're going to need to have that in your back pocket. Players to look for at uh, Toledo, Daquan Finn, their quarterback, leading rusher, leading passer. They're 2-0. and They beat UMass. They beat Long Island. They haven't played Murder's Row. This is their big game. They fared fairly well. He's looked pretty good. And so he's a running threat. So it's going to a lot of this is going to fall on the defensive line. The linebackers keep him in the pocket from scrambling. Stop those quarterback designed runs as well. That's another big element of something you have to watch for and look for getting the designed runs with him. So they've got to eliminate that, have to stop those designed runs and scrambling for Daquan Finn, their quarterback, who is really kind of their do-it-all guy. When you have your quarterback leading your team, obviously in passing, but rushing as well. The ball is staying in his hands, and he is obviously a vital part of your offense. Get the ball out of his hands, bottle him up, and don't let him go anywhere. Uh Jerron Newton, their leading receiver, not a big dude. You know, a little bit similar to last week, although not quite as small um, as their leading guy. Uh, was it Fram- Fleming? Fleming last week, I believe. Um, he was like 5'5", five, 5'6". Five, five, uh, Newton, not huge, 5'11", buck 90. Um, can get it done. Quick receiver. He's their leading target. And so look for uh, Finn to be able to try to find him. Get some plays in space, a little run after the catch. They'll move him inside, move him outside. Uh, so that's big to obviously watch. And then on defense, they've got a number, and they've got a number of transfers up and down the line where you're going to see some power five guys, guys from the Big Ten. Uh, but one guy who I, I really like in particular, who's had some pretty good games thus far for Toledo, and he's a Toledo native, is Dallas Gantt. He started his career at Ohio State. He left and entered the portal last season, went back home, Found a home in Toledo. He's playing really good football. But obviously, he got recruited at Ohio State and committed here because he had the ability. Now, he didn't play as much as he wanted, and maybe he didn't get on the field quite as much as he would have liked, so he left. But this is a guy who has big-time ability, and you've got to keep an eye on those guys. You know, he's good in coverage. He moves well. He's a decent blitzer. He does a lot of stuff pretty good. And he's a very conscientious kid, and don't think for a second that he's not going to want to make plays coming back into Ohio Stadium. So take that as a given. They've got a number of guys who are like him, but I focus on him because he is the former Buckeye right there. A couple of other games we're going to dive into. Uh, Michigan State traveling to Washington. Michigan State is ranked 11th. 
after Ohio State and Michigan, they're the next highest ranked team. All four teams that are ranked right now, with Penn State included, are all in the East. Michigan and Michigan State are going to play each other soon in a couple weeks. Michigan State cannot lose this football game. They need to be ranked in the top 10 when they play Michigan. So whoever loses does not fall that far because you need to have those teams clustered. Ohio State will obviously play them both, and you don't need them with any more losses. Once you get in the Big Ten, it's zero-sum football, so you have to win the games you're supposed to in the Big Ten, beating the bad teams, but then also winning these big non-conference games. You know, Peyton Thorne has been pretty decent for him. He's back at quarterback. Uh, Running back situation, obviously, with Walker the third being gone. They're working through that. Uh, Jalen uh, Jaden Reed is back. They're uh, one of their star wide receivers who was hurt last year. And Keon Coleman is another their leading receiver actually this year in total uh, by yards. And so those are the guys that they're focusing on the outside uh, to be pretty good and to have some success. So they need to get that win. Sparty's 2-0. and Mel Tucker, this would be a huge win for him. Washington, not tremendous, but you need to make sure they get a win. You can't pull Wisconsin last week and lose to Washington State like they did. So take care of the other side of the Apple Cup and get that done. Huge game now. Number 22, Penn State traveling to Auburn. They beat Auburn at home last season. You know, they've got Sean Clifford as a starter quarterback. Drew Aller, the, the freshman from Cleveland, Ohio, for mentor, pretty talented player. They've been working him in. He's been playing a little bit. You know, when Clifford's been hurt, they're trying to sneak him in and get him in there. That's a 330 kick that you're going to need to keep an eye on as well. Auburn is not great this year. They tried to fire and have a coup to get Brian Harson fired this offseason. They're not one of the better teams in the SEC. Must-win game for Penn State. They were able to beat Purdue to open the season. They're doing a pretty good job. They're ranked 22nd. You beat Auburn, even if it's not a great Auburn team. It's the perception of beating an SEC West foe that's going to bolster your resume. And it can slowly work them up because, like I said, they're playing Michigan State. They're going to play Michigan. They'll play Ohio State. They can't afford to have another loss. And Ohio State doesn't need them to have another loss. Win your big non-conference games. And then the last one we'll take a look at. We're trying to get some help in the West. Wisconsin crushed the Big Ten by losing. Iowa crushed the Big Ten by just having no offense and losing to Iowa State. Those are normally the two big dogs at the top. Nebraska, I was hoping for more from them. I mean, heck, I, we can't even get into their loss to Georgia Southern. Um, Purdue, I think, could be good, but they already have that loss to Penn State at the start of the season. Minnesota, dark horse to win the West. Colorado's coming to town. Minnesota's 2-0. They've got Muhammad Ibrahim back. They've got Tanner Morgan back for his 17th year at quarterback. They need to get this win. They get to 3-0. and They get to 4-0. and They can get in the top 25. But Ohio State needs somebody ranked at least in the top 20, if not the top 15, for the Big Ten Championship game. And I think Minnesota might be that team now. They might have the ability to take care of business enough to be able to have success and get it done. And then one other game I'll have an eye on. Uh, the U, University of Miami, 13, traveling to number 24, a and Jimbo Fisher put in Max Johnson now as a starting quarterback. He's going against uh, Van Dyke's Van Dyke for Miami. We'll see how that kind of shakes out. Jimbo Fisher, can he afford another loss? Be dropped to two and two on the season. That would be catastrophic for him. Uh, but that'll be an entertaining one to check out as well. Uh, but the Colorado Minnesota game, big one. Penn State Auburn, 330. And then Michigan State Washington, also a night game, 730. So that'll give you something hopefully to watch if the second half of the Buckeye game, once the Bucks have it under control. Thank you for tuning in for the Toledo preview. Um, subscribe, like, continue to comment, ask questions. We're going to do the mailbag every week for all your Buckeye questions on whatever you want to ask me. I'll find a way to find the answer out for you. Uh, but until next time, we'll see you later.